Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. It is always a pleasure to welcome back the outstanding Neil Kulong, my good friend. Thank you so much for your time today. What, do I got him there? Yeah, there, there we go. I think I get you now. Hello, Neil. Am I here now? Yes, you've been there the entire time. The question is, did I have the ability to reel you in? <laughs> well, 15 seconds ago, I was happy to be here, and I'm still happy to be here now. So. <laughs> Perfect. We're all good. That's what we do. Uh, how on the face of the earth are the Pittsburgh Steelers 3-2? and two? I watched that team, and there's no way they should be 3-2. and two. I, I, I don't know, but is this not the same thing we've been saying over the last three seasons now. Yeah. It, it, the only thing they do well is win games. And I initially had said that as like a joke, and it was like two years ago, but it, it's the truth. I mean, it, to be fair, the defense went off the rails in the second half. I mean, they, they, that was one of the best half performances I think they've had in, in, in quite a while. It was impressive to see. Uh, definitely took a, a big step forward with that, but Offensively, um, you know, it's snap to snap, you don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it. Uh, they they should not be a three and two team. But the funny thing is, it, it the manner in which these games are being played. I don't think they've played a good game out of five. And I can make as many arguments that they should be one and four as I can. They should be four and one. Right. And I once again, we just have no sense of who this team is, but. As a coach, and I I said this about Baltimore leading into the game, Harbaugh will eventually decide that he wants to to play it safe against Pittsburgh's defense. And what's going to happen is they're going to take it away from him. If you give them the opportunity to play the game in the muck, they're going to take you down there, and they are more than comfortable winning that way. If they have to block a punt through the end zone to win, if that's going to get the ball back to them, and then from there, if their their offense makes one play of the entire game, it's going to be the biggest play of the game, and you're going to find yourself on the the losing end of a game you had no business losing. And John Harbaugh, of all people, should know that because the Steelers have done that something four or five times the last three years to them. It, it's just it's it's crazy the amount of times they have been able to beat Baltimore. Um, largely because the Ravens don't want to, to play above the, the Steelers' level. And I don't mean talent-wise. I just mm-hmm. mean um, Jackson threw well. You know, they, they dropped a bunch, and that doesn't help. But right. they did plenty to win that game until they decided um, they had to be simple with everything, and they couldn't just kind of continue doing what they were doing early. And they, they, left, they let the Steelers back in the game, and the Steelers – defense made two plays on him. Um, Jackson screwed up pretty badly twice, and they allowed a block punt. That's how the Steelers win these kinds of games. And by law of averages, you shouldn't be able to do this more than once a season, but it's like all of their wins now. Um, it's it's remarkable and crazy, and I, I, I can't figure it out. I've tried for two and a half years now. I just know that it will continue, and I don't think that they'll be able to do it next week either, and they probably will. So, yeah, uh, Jackson did some good things, but this is the part that baffles me. You get down to the five-yard line, whatever they are, you know, and this this is right before the Joey Porter Jr. interception, which is a good play by Joey. Uh, but how do you have a guy with the legs of Lamar Jackson and not attempt to utilize them there? To me, it's like... I think everybody's trying to make him into this thrower all the time to prove to the world he throws the ball. He's been in the league long enough. He throws the ball decently, not great. And guess what? The guy can run. I don't understand why why Baltimore doesn't take advantage of that when they've got a chance to put the game away. The the funny thing is that the play that I would look at that described that perfectly was the one that uh, the Ravens won't admit it and they won't speak about it, but um, I believe it was the end of uh, the first half. They had the ball inside the 20, or maybe it was inside the 30. Uh, They wanted to get a field goal at the end, 
and for whatever reason, uh, Jackson ran the play. I think it was on fourth down. He obviously, Harbaugh obviously wanted to run the clock down while they're at the line in case you know the Steelers jump or something like that. Uh, Jackson snapped it, yeah, and they're they're not blocked up for it. Uh, Watt was left untouched, which you know I don't I, I don't know if they've paid attention. That's not the guy to to let go free. I'm trying to think, and yeah, yeah, you might be right about that. Watt immediately comes in and cuts off Jackson's running option. Right. And right there, it's like, it, it's almost as if Jackson wanted to hike the ball so he could run. But even the defense wasn't going to let him run in that situation. Um, point being, you can tell Harbaugh on the sideline was, was amazed that the ball was snapped. It just, it seemed to me like the ball was never supposed to be snapped. But it, it, at a 10,000 foot level, it was like, it was the only opportunity. Uh, where it looked like Lamar wanted to run the ball. Right. It's as if everybody is telling him not to, and I I agree with you. He's a good thrower. He's not a great one. Right. Um, he can do some damage with his arm, but his dual threat is what makes him who he is. That's right. And he did some stuff early. You know, yep. he got loose a little bit. It wasn't designed, but that stopped. You know, and it really kind of seemed more like, Hey Lamar, we're up. We're nursing a lead. Do not run the ball, okay? Don't leave the pocket. Do not run the ball, because he tightened up. And the, the interception, uh, good for Joey Porter Jr. He's right where he's supposed mm-hmm. to be. He played yep. that perfectly, but he's not going to get an interception in the NFL easier than that. I mean, wow. What I don't know what was wrong with Jackson on that throw, but that was terrible. Yep. Um, mistakes like that lose a game, and it, it seems to me it's just pure speculation and observation it seems to me like there's some type of mandate being put on jackson to not run in certain situations you know not i don't even mean necessarily third and four Mm -hmm. don't ever run i mean clock is this score is this quarter is this don't run we don't want you to run these are the things we want you to do Mm -hmm. but at the same time when you have you know seven drops five of them were just catastrophically bad um, you need somebody on your team to, to you know generate offense and Jackson was the only guy that was doing that right. and did a pretty good job of it I you know cutting him loose seems to be kind of the way he wants to play he's comfortable playing I, I don't know why they do that but uh, the Steelers certainly thank him you have to play defense to your offense and offense to your defense well in this case we know the Steeler offense is treading water are they doing a good enough job, in your opinion, of playing defense to their offense? Meaning, look, I'll give you an example. We talked about Iowa a couple of weeks ago. Iowa does everything in their power not to let any receiver get behind them. Everything. You can run a double move, they won't bite, they got to stay back. Because their offense can't make up for it. Are the Steelers doing a good enough job of playing defense to their offense? That's a tough one. Um, a game like Sunday, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, because they needed to get the ball back multiple times and they needed to not allow any points uh, to give the offense absolutely every chance that it, that it had. Um, but it, it's, it's such a spontaneous defense. They, they really work you to a point where you, as an offense, you, you've exposed yourself uh, to the defense, allowing the defense to make a play on you. And that's really what the defense did. Um, Larry Ogunjobi, uh, a, a veteran in the league, runs your skill guy down from behind mm-hmm. and plays it perfectly, forces a fumble. He may as well have been T.J. Watt on that play. It's exactly what Watt would have done. It's obvious that it's an emphasis uh, within their defensive room. But those kinds of things are offensive for the Steelers. Mm-hmm. So my question is, not only are they setting it up for the offense, it's almost more like we're just taking over the whole thing because you're not doing it. Mm-hmm. And we've seen that in, in two wins this year. So it, it almost seems like by necessity, but other teams are allowing them to do it more so than the Steelers are doing it to uh, their opponent. I, well, it, maybe not that, but they are looking to make plays on the ball and they're doing it in timely situations as, as Tom would say on weighty down uh, they're winning those more often than not at the same time though you see total collapses and lack of communication in games like uh, against Houston 
where you know nothing is working for you and you're you're not really fixing anything either so um in in some cases i believe they are but there there are instances in which they're not either they're they're a dangerous play to play defense but they're not showing that they're a very consistent one at this point either so the game on monday night was green bay and and the raiders and Garoppolo and Love, not a scintillating quarterback matchup, and it played out that way. What is your opinion? Now that we've got five games under everybody's belt, what do you think the level of play in the league is, and how smart is the league right now in terms of how it is being played? I think overall, um, that, that's a really interesting question. I, I would say it looks better at the top the last couple this year than it has the last couple years. Um, I, I you watch San Francisco play that that's just a phenomenal team, no doubt. Uh, and I thought Dallas was playing pretty well. Mm-hmm. They they boat raced Dallas. I mean that that wasn't competitive. Um, San Francisco is at a high level now. Typically, we'll see you know the 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 front runner kind of you know maybe fall off a little bit while Kansas City picks up and <laughs> they yeah. do their cagey veteran thing and figure out ways to win every game. Right. Um, we're seeing more teams put up great performances early, I think, than, than we have in the past. Yeah. Um, the bottom is odd because you look at Cincinnati um, and, and with biased glasses on, no one is going to think that Cincinnati is one of the worst teams in the game. But through Sunday, Fairly, they were. Right. That wasn't a fluke. It wasn't an accident. It's not just, you know, well, Cincinnati isn't playing well. They were bad. They played like a very bad football team. Mm-hmm. At the same time, the team that they kind of, you know, maybe got right a little bit against, Arizona, is playing 10 times better than I thought they would. Right. So in, in, in one way, I think there might be a little more at the top, but it, it really seems to me like the bottom is a lot better than it has been in the past. Arizona, you know, by by rights and by roster, shouldn't have won a game all year. That's I mean, right. That that was a legitimate prediction from a yep. lot of people. Yep. Um, you you see bad play. We've seen uh, in Denver a, a historically bad loss, and having to come back as as much as they did the next week against uh, uh, Chicago, only to to let it fall away. And Chicago themselves being a, a, a total train wreck. They just don't seem to be quarter to quarter week to week bad the way we've seen in the past so right. it, to me it kind of seems like the bottom is is a little bit better than it has been and i think that uh in, increases some viability overall now the follow-up question would be why is las vegas on national tv so much i i have no idea I have no idea but either. that 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 packers raiders game was not uh it was close <laughs> i'm not sure how good it was Right. But uh, Raiders Raiders are going nowhere fast, and that's uh, kind of a maybe a little bit of a surprise. But um, Green Bay uh, probably won a little bit more uh, early than what we're seeing them to be now. Uh, not out and out surprises, but these aren't train wrecks either. I mean, Denver would probably be the the, the leader in the clubhouse for the top pick as of right now. They they seem to be uh, the worst team overall. But uh, I I don't think. You know, 31 through 25 are terrible football teams either. That's just me. Yeah. Any trend in the league that's a little different this year? I mean, every, there's always something where, like, okay, something becomes like with baseball. Suddenly out of nowhere, you know, every pitch is a sweeper. Okay, great. It's not a slider or a curve. It's a sweeper. Uh, anything you're seeing that's a little different trend that everybody seems to be picking up on? I think we hear... Put it this way, I, I think today's trend is the talking point of tomorrow. Yeah. And because of that, I, I really think the fact that um, an off season of consternation over injury, over pedigree, the fact that right now it, it's you can't to, to dilute it a little bit. You cannot have an MVP conversation right now without mentioning Brock Purdy. Right. Um, the trend in that sense is look at how many high priced, high acquisition quarterbacks have completely fallen apart. You know, Cleveland mm-hmm. versus Denver is going to be the joke bowl 
yeah. next season at the right. pace that those two teams are on. Right. Meanwhile, the literal last pick of the draft is arguably the MVP of the league. Yep. Now, we can go back between two or three people, and if, if it's not Purdy, okay, but he makes a very strong case. I know that. How is that happening? You know, um, do we want to go as far as to say it's, it's no longer – uh, uh, high-end quarterback stats, not this this complete massacre of a game, a, a, an assault of Patrick Mahomes throwing four dimes against the Raiders in the second quarter alone. We're we're not seeing that so much, but but Purdy operates in such a way that he's he's not making bad reads, he's not making mistakes. How how is that happening? And you will argue chicken versus the egg all day. Mm-hmm. There is a, a certain amount of talent that comes with that. But Trevor Lawrence, with a great coach, yep. with a pedigree, yep. who's played a lot more than Brock Purdy has, why does he still struggle? You know, right. what, what's it, it to me? It kind of brings up you know the the marriage of coach and scheme kind of seems mm-hmm. to be more, uh, excuse me, of, of, of scheme and quarterback, uh, it, it seems like that's, you know, tomorrow's talking point and, and whatever that might be because um, to, to, you know, put a, a, a point on all of it, Tua is is the big gun-slinging quarterback. Yes. Wasn't that the knock against him before? He doesn't have the arm? Yep. He's chucking up 40 points a game and it's a great scheme. You know, it, it fits him very well. They went out and got guys to play within that scheme, and it's working very well. So, to me, the question comes into, in a a, a really deep quarterback draft, in my opinion, how much emphasis will a team's uh, uh, schematic philosophy go into drafting who they're going to draft? And, uh, along with that, what veteran quarterback that can't get it done anymore is going to be gone? And I guess the, the answer to me in both those questions is, you know, Caleb Williams in Denver. Right. What would they do together? You know, and it, it, it's almost like Sean Payton saw this happening yeah. in, in a way. I don't want to propose that. We'll hear about that plenty, I'm sure. Yeah. But um, schematically, you can see Williams fit within what uh, uh, Payton has done in the past, and they can build up around that and create, you know, the the – you know, the, kind of the anti-Purdy in the sense right. of the first pick instead of the last, and go in and have a lot of schematic success because you got a player that fits very well in uh, what you're comfortable calling, what you're comfortable coaching. Well, and there's, there's one other part, and I'll just make this quick because I know we're at the end here. Purdy had four years uh, at Iowa State, played all four years. Okay, so all the great plays were on there, all the warts are on there. The flash in the pan guy that, that starts for a year and like flashes potential, the NFL seems to be drawn to that guy because there aren't as many warts. All right. And a guy like Purdy showed pro and con, and that's how I think people shied away from him. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I would also put a, a, there has to be a good amount of emphasis put on the fact that they're not done developing. I know it seems like they should be, and this, a lot of it is a reference to Kenny Pickett, yep. but they're going to continue to improve. They're going to continue to work and get better, and it's not just on the coach to do that. It is on the quarterback to do that. I think Purdy should be commended yep. uh, for the fact that and we've talked about this. He was You saw it immediately when he started playing with San Francisco. He is a way better player mm-hmm. physically than he was at Iowa State. Yep, that, that's That's a fact. So he put the work in to become a better player. It's not just Shanahan moves the machines to these places and he knows to throw it here. He physically looked like a much better player, much more decisive. He had a much stronger arm. Sir, always a pleasure, and you know that. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys.